go live. So we are live also to everyone who is joining us from afar. And for those of you who are joining us from afar, thank you for telling us where you're tuning in from. And can you give me a thumbs up in the YouTube chat if you can hear me well? And we'll just wait for that and hope that thumbs ups are all over the place. For those in the room, I should introduce myself. It's a good way to start. I can, and actually, it's a good reminder. I have a microphone that I should turn on. Great. And now is that a little bit better for the room? Thank you. So that's one of the beauties of hybrid events. My name is Jacqueline Sundberg. I'm the outreach librarian here at Roar. And this is not our first hybrid event, but there's always something that you forget. So in this case, I'm glad it was the in-room microphone. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so yes, welcome everyone. Welcome back. If this is a repeat visit, if you've been to an event here before, or if you've been to one of the knitting events before, welcome back. Um, I'm delighted today to be doing another event with Dr. Kristen Howard right here liaison librarian for our history department here at McGill, and of course, a talented, and I have to say prolific knitter. <laughs> so we ask that all of you do respect the friendly community spirit of this event. You can share your thoughts, your questions, and your comments and your works in progress. I can see for those who are here in person that there are some lovely projects on the go. And Kristen and I were just thinking that I wanna learn what all of them are and also what products you're using. Um, for those of you online, feel free to share your works in progress or your thoughts in the chat throughout the event. Um, so today we're celebrating knitting and also natural her story. I uh, use that word and for those of you who follow that, that on social media, there's some really interesting content that's posted under natural her story. So today, we're doing a follow-up event to one that we did last month on April 11th. We had a scholar come in, Tina Gianquido, and she spoke about 19th century women plant collectors who went out into the field, collected specimens and created herbaria or contributed to the work of natural historians and scientists who were soliciting these kinds of contributions from women and collectors all over the world. And she gave a really excellent talk. It was titled, I have to, respect is what a nuisance sex is, women plant collectors in the 19th century. You can watch that one on our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about the books that we are talking about and touching on today and about the women who put them together. Tina's talk was eye-opening and I learned a new word which is botanizing. So that's a fun hobby that you can develop in addition to your love of knitting. She provided a new perspective on the herbaria that are in our collection as well as botanical specimen books. Um, so, like I said, the talk is on YouTube and we will pop it, a link in the chat. Uh, but today is the partner event and my colleague Kristen and I are looking at those same specimen books and herbaria from a knitted perspective. Um, and we use them as inspiration for a new knitting pattern that Kristen has been working on. Botanical specimen books are collections that are really bound between covers. They have their own stories. Every element in a specimen book was gathered somewhere and it was compiled by an individual. Sometimes these books were made just for personal use and a herbaria may be created during the course of a trip where you collected flowers at the different manors or countries that you visited. And sometimes they were collected and um, created for publication. And one of those is one of the ones you see on the screen here. We acknowledge that we are here on land that has long served as a place of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Ganyangahaga Nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nation. We honor, recognize, and respect those nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we're meeting today. Those nations are also the stewards of local plant knowledge and knowledge of the plants that really are of here. And I want to encourage all of us today as we look at our natural history collections and we're seeing plants that grew elsewhere that have had many long and varied journeys to come to our collections here. I encourage you to look for inspiration to the plant culture that's local to you. Perhaps it's right outside your front door. For me, I live very close to Mount Royal. So some of the plants that I'll show you in the specimen books and illustrated works today are actually to be found in the Subwa on Mont Royal. So Kristen and I are going to be sharing our inspiration. Uh, oh yes, I should actually mention that. If you do want to send in questions, you can also send those to roar.library at 
mcgill.ca by email chat encouraged and i do have two colleagues moderating the chat if you have questions you can reach out to them via the mcgill library youtube account so Kristen and I are going to be sharing our inspiration and the process of creating this pattern, as well as the source books. So if you're interested in botany, you'll get a bit of that. If you're interested in color work, you'll get a bit of that as well. Thanks in advance for sharing your lunch hour, your curiosity, and your enthusiasm with us today. My colleague Lauren Williams is actually unable to join us today, but she's the curator for the Blackerwood collection here. And that's the collection of natural history that a lot of these books are from. She, I have notes from her, so I'm going to give them on her behalf. And a lot of the books that we looked at in thinking through what this pattern could be based on are from that collection, which was established in 1920 by that blurry gentleman in the center there. He, his name is Dr. Casey Wood. He was an ophthalmologist and who really, towards the end of his medical career, developed a very, very strong interest in bird vision, writing books about it, collecting books about it. And eventually his library was donated to McGill and he collected on behalf of McGill as well. Wow. Bird vision, ornithology and ophthalmology. There's two good O-ologies <laughs> for you. <laughs> so after arriving at McGill, after donation, it continued to grow and it now collects includes material covering all of the natural sciences from the medieval period right up to the 20th century. So since taking on responsibility for this collection, Lauren has often been really pleasantly surprised to find how extensive it is. When rare book dealers send catalogs or when she's at book fairs, she often finds that we already have a copy of whatever is on offer. However, one area did emerge as a bit of a gap, and that is actually botany, surprisingly. Casey Wood was more interested in birds than plants. <laughs> so, and vertebrate zoology actually, that as well. So unfortunately he didn't spend as much time seeking out works of botanical illustration or specimen books. Perhaps because of the time period also he was collecting in the 1920s or perhaps a lack of books for sale. There are not as very many female naturalists in our collection either. So rather ironically now, around 50 to 60% of the reference questions that Lauren gets relate in some way to botany or to women in natural history. So over the last few years, she made a very concerted effort to build up the collection in these areas. She acquired new books, particularly herbaria and commonplace books that were kept by women during the 19th century. So the Victorian era, so a real explosion of interest in exploring and in documenting the natural world. Let's see if I need to change slides, I do, sorry. There they are. So this is one example that for those of you here in person, you can see in the display case outside. This one and most of the specimen books in fact are quite fragile. So I'll be showing them via document camera a little bit later on, but it, to handle them extensively, it would be to the damage of the flowers that are preserved inside. But this is an example um, of one of these books. It's a notebook, a scrapbook, handwritten compilation where women would paste in botanical specimens that they'd found, complete with scientific or common names, sometimes interspersed with experts of poetry or illustrations, postcards, messages to friends and the like. The books were not necessarily meant for posterity and were sometimes passed between family members or but added to by different women. So they have a really remarkable viewpoint into the intimate lives of with the women who created them. They also allow us a really valuable window into the extent of knowledge about botany that was held by their creators. This photo shows one of those recently acquired works. So this one is by Jane Hood. There are also a few other delights in the case outside. So for you here in person, I encourage you to take a look on your way out. They include another stunning work by Maria Sibylla Marion. It was a 17th century work on the general history of insects in Suriname and Europe. It is a work on entomology, but she does include the plants on which the bugs are found. So the botany link is there. There's also one out there that you'll see in the slides, a uh, painting by Elizabeth Quillen, a painting of flowers that she did in South India in the 19th century. So I reached out to Lauren last summer with the request to use botanical illustrations to form the basis of this, at that point, imagined, imaginary to be developed knitting pattern. Initiatives like these, once again, in Lauren's words, bring these wonderful books to a much wider audience. Lauren was instrumental in helping me identify books that might be of interest. 
And if you do have any further questions about the botanical books or the works you see today, I'm happy to share Lauren's contact information and our collections are open for all to come and consult between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. There's my sales pitch. Yeah, we'd love to see you all if you're in the Montreal area. So last year, I really did dive into some of these books in greater detail. So this on the left, you see a photo of Agnes Chamberlain, who has a lot of names. That was her last name, but uh, she began life as Agnes Dunbar Fitzgibbon Chamberlain. She illustrated that beautiful work that you see on the right. We'll see some more selections in a bit. But I dove into these books, sketching from these illustrations in my own preferred style, pen and ink, taking photos, and eventually playing with different elements using digital tools. This lovely one, are the it shows the plants that are really from this area, Montreal and Eastern Ontario, the area around Rice Lake and Peterborough was where she lived and published and drew from nature in creating this work. I followed the botanical trail and actually that's a pun, <laughs> which I have to explain. So that means it's not a good one, but the author of the last book is actually Catherine Parr Trail. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll not explain my puns from now on. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> but I follow the, this, this book is, um, it's interesting when you're searching through the catalog, that book was called Canadian Wildflowers. This book is also called Canadian Wildflowers, but by a different illustrator. And I was captivated by the images. And then I realized that H. Ross, like so many at the time, was not a woman. And I was specifically looking for works that had been created by women as we were looking into this the acts of preservation and of collection and of, of really thoughtful arrangement that these women were doing in the 19th century. That's what I wanted to preserve and translate into a new fibercraft project. And so this one, unfortunately, the lovely got cut because Ross failed to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> this one is the one I mentioned, a painting by Lady Elizabeth Quillam, Nay Simons. It's a watercolor painting and she was known for her paintings and her correspondence, actually. There's been a great research interest in recent times in her work and that of her sister who lived in South India in the early 19th century. I looked at this and was like, oh, it's lovely. And I created a chart in a tool called Stitch Fiddle, which I encourage you all to explore. Um, you can create color work charts based on images or you can draw from scratch. It's fun to fiddle with. <laughs> and this one, if you look at it, oh yeah, good, thank you. Um, I lost my place though, here we are. This chart really to me though is unknittable or unattractive to knit. And for those in the room, maybe if you disagree, I'm happy to share it, you can knit it and show me how it goes. But what it has, there's too much detail. You can't read the numbers, but there's 150 rows high and it's not repeatable. And so I was like, oh, okay, this was my early attempt. I haven't really created a color work chart before, but I was like, the picture is so lovely and the colors are lovely. So I tried it out. I think it would make an excellent cross stitch pattern or embroidery if you want to try it out. I encourage you to do so. The original is in the case outside it is actually quite large, which is why this translated into such a large chart. It's 46 centimeters, so half a meter high by about 30 centimeters wide, it's quite large. The next one, and I'm gonna see the floor and invite Kristen up here with me. Um, this is the book that actually, I don't know, won the prize in the end. This, yes. <laughs> this we selected, and this is the basis of the pattern that, that uh, Kristen created. So I flagged a few specimens in this book. Um, it's called Ocean Flowers and Their Teachings by Mary Matilda Howard. And it's really kind of surprising. And we'll see a little bit more inside. There's something kind of otherworldly about pressed and dried seaweed. It's regular, but really unexpected in the way that um, it's something that it really is very far from its element. In life, it would be waving around in the water. And here its angles are pressed into a flat and unexpected shape. So seaweed and algae, which is what is in this book, when pressed looks remarkably different than the living plant. So there's the living plant. You can almost taste salt when you look at this picture. I remember playing with this as a child when you go to the beach. But necessarily, when you press and dry seaweed as she did in this book, 
um, it loses that dimensionality, that three dimensionality, but it does preserve some of that texture and the angles that are really, really very interesting. It's almost antler-like. So I saw the potential for pillar work. I collected some more images and I started to send my work to Kristen and said, okay, <laughs> what can we do with this? Um, another way that this book did inspire me as well is through the colors. And we'll talk more about that in a bit when I show some more examples under the document camera here, and you'll see them up on screen. But what I did eventually was start to play with repeats. I used digital tools, I chopped up images and started to make create motifs out of things that were single images. And there's some of the early ones that didn't quite, didn't make the cut, but I started to, to play around with different patterns and what we could do. They didn't make the cut yet, but that yes. doesn't mean that they can't It, can't it might become. be here later it, on, yes. indeed. Uh, so this is the one that I ended up um, selecting this particular uh, type of seaweed. And I think part of what I found so interesting was I had never really thought about seaweed being a botanical before. The author very specifically titled this book um, Ocean Flowers, right? And I had never thought of seaweed as a, as a flower before, and I found it really interesting. Um, so this is the dried specimen that I ended up choosing, the one that you can see on the right, Hylidrocilla quosa. Um, and here is uh, one of many different images I found of a living species on the left. And um, I didn't actually look at any images of the living species until after I had finished the entire pattern, all of the knitting and everything, and realized um, we found that this was one that where they looked really different, uh, that the color um, of the dried specimen looked really different and it just didn't look uh, quite the same because it's such a small piece. If you look up more images of this online, you'll see these kind of huge billowing uh, plants, which actually I think is, um, I hope uh, is part of what my pattern ended up evoking um, much more the living species than the dried one. But uh, for, for some reason, this dried species is the one that just called out to me um, as being something that we could take not the entire thing because the entire thing would end up um, with a very long chart in the same way that Jacqueline showed earlier. But if I took a small cross section of it so I could make something infinitely repeatable um, that I thought would be perfect for um, a large uh, circular uh, tubular cowl. Uh, so here we'll see um, on the left again, I have uh, the specimen and then here are the two charts that I created and it is the same chart. I just decided that I wanted to do something that I thought would be a bit interesting with the colors that I wanted to be able to knit it uh, both uh, the standard way that I envisioned it as well as the inverse. And for those of you who are also knitters who do color work, if you've ever decided to knit something and you've decided to inverse, which is the dark color and the light color, especially if I'm knitting in the evening, I can get a bit tired and forget which color I'm supposed to be doing. So I made just two different versions of the charts uh, to make sure um, that I would always know which one I was looking at. And as compared to Jacqueline's chart before that was um, right too tall to be very fun to knit, I chose um, to make something that was uh, uh, 12 stitches by 20 rows, so something that we could really easily repeat. And um, I was very careful to make sure that the bottom and the top were going to match so that again, it would be infinitely repeatable. And so then here we see again, uh, the sample. Um, you can see how much I love the sample that I just showed it to you three times in a row, right? And here it is uh, with the finished shawl. And actually I don't have it with me. I'll just go grab it for a second. Sorry for mine. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, finished object. So we should be able to see it here in the room as well as online with the picture. And so, as I said, I made the two different charts, the two colors, and I decided to uh, make half of the cowl with the light color being dominant and half of the cowl with the dark color being dominant. Um, of course, if you didn't like that, you wouldn't have to do that. Now, something that ended up being kind of a fun surprise that I was not expecting is I found while I was knitting it, and Jacqueline found this also while she was knitting, um, while she's knitting her sample, which is on the table up here, um, is that it also works just as well upside down. Um, and it's kind of a fun, almost mind trick of deciding, wait, which direction am I, am I knitting and, and which colors am I uh, holding dominant right now? Which, which, which am I doing again? Um, but so I ended up really uh, being very happy with that um, because I feel like it evokes um, the seaweed, you know, coming up from the ground and waving in the ocean. And so I'm very pleased uh, with that. And since I'm holding the sample, I'll also show you that I decided to um, include a twist in mine. Um, I think that that makes a less attractive 
object, but a more attractive item to actually wear. That's what I found when I've knit cows like this before. Um, so of course that's an option, but if you're knitting this, you don't have to include that. It's just whether or not you like it. But I do tend to like how this style of cow fits a bit better. Um, and I chose uh, the greens um, in part because that's yarn that I had in stash, uh, uh, but also because I thought that it would really help evoke the botanical idea as well as the um, idea of seaweed as well. Uh, and then um, I guess we can, I wanted to show one more thing. So I'm gonna go back actually, sorry. I also wanted to show my failed sample. <laughs> Uh, because it's interesting to see failures as well as successes, right? So when I first was thinking about knitting this pattern, I chose um, a different colorway and a different kind of option. So I used this, so this is the failed sample. So my original idea was to do the same cow, the same length um, in three different chunks uh, with the idea that when I was writing the pattern, you, the knitter, could decide which, if any, of these you wanted to do. If you wanted to make a, an entirely solid cowl, you surely could. Um, and then I had a different pattern in the middle, and then I was going to have my seaweed pattern at the end. And my idea was going to be that I had the ocean in the blue, and then I had um, sand, and then I was going to have the seaweed with blue and green. Uh, it turned out that my blue and green uh, I did not do the, the check that one should always do when knitting color work of taking a picture of them together, changing it to black and white to see if the colors are different enough that you'll actually have the contrast. There's no contrast with this, uh, which you can see here. And I also had started it when I had an earlier version of the chart where it ended up just being too, too skinny. You just really couldn't see the seaweed motif kind of popping through. Um, and then at that stage, I had spent about... 20 inches of knitting, thinking about what I wanted to do for the motif. And I decided that the overall pattern was really going to have a better effect for what I wanted to do. So, you know, maybe I'll end up uh, doing something with this. I'm not sure. Um, I might just rip it out and make something else out of it. But this was my, my failed idea. But that shows you kind of the idea of how I was um, approaching this uh, when making this pattern. And so then after I quit this and decided I need to try something else. That's when I turned to my other two and you can see my teeny, teeny, tiny partial uh, swatch where I decided, and it's actually upside down, where I decided, okay, this contrast will work and I like this better and it's going to work. I knew that it was going to, well, I had hoped it was going to work. I right. have a question, what kind of yarn did you use? Okay, so uh, a question about what kind of yarn I, I used. Um, so uh, I was in graduate school for a, a very long time. Um, and so during that time, I developed a habit of overall being a budget yarn shopper. And I still have some of my budget yarn left over from my student days. And um, I'm also originally American. So my favorite budget yarn store uh, before I came to Canada, and it ships here, it's a bit more expensive, is Knit Picks. And so um, uh, I bought uh, all of the yarn on good sales. And this what is a discontinued Knit Picks um, uh, that's um, uh, upcycled. Uh, so this is where they were spinning. Um, and when you spin, so I gather you lose a lot of fiber and you can sweep it up and re-spin something else. This is um, upcycled. And then these are actually, although the dark green may be discontinued, this is Knit Picks Wool of the Andes. Uh, which is their kind of worsted line. They're like good workhorse, not very expensive yarn in tweed. And I have a, a sweater in each of these colors. This is a leftover. Um, so uh, Knit Picks is my favorite kind of budget. It would be really beautiful in uh, Brooklyn Tweed's shelter, I think, if you wanted a bit more of a, what I would consider a, a more expensive, not quite upscale, but more expensive yarn. But any worsted weight wool would work really well for this in two strong contrasting colors. Um, and Jacqueline's sample is an, an entirely different uh, colorway that harkens back to some of the images that Jacqueline pulled from the botanicals that she really, really enjoyed. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> Are you taking commissions? <laughs> uh, I have knit on commission once in the past, uh, uh, but in general, I, I don't do commissions because I have, there's so many things I want to knit for myself and my loved ones, but mostly myself, right? Um, so then I uh, will share again the slide that I wanted to point out that this is the third kind of collaboration that Jacqueline and I have done, uh, pulling items from the rare books collections here and turning them into knitting patterns. And so I just wanted to point out to you that uh, all three of these are available for free um, on Ravel we have events for all of them. Um, this event is still happening, uh, but, <laughs> but the recording will be up on YouTube that, that you can watch. And we have the samples in person as well. If anybody wants to come see them. Um, and if you want 
to be reminded about the inspiration behind them, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. So now we're going to see the book itself. I'm going to switch here and we'll turn this one on. So there's my hand, everyone. <laughs> so what we're going to do at show first is, well, actually, I can show this as I've got it now. This is the other colorway. This is what I chose, inspired by that rosy pink that you'll see in real life in a little bit. This is a worsted weight yarn I bought over in the plateau from the one on Mont Royal, Bobby Nose. Yes, and this is their, I think they're like standard store brand worsted, which has a lot of structure and I'm hoping will soften a little bit after blocking. But I knit so quickly that I actually did what all the knitters shouldn't do and actually gave myself a really sore wrist. So take breaks, <laughs> do your stretches and choose your color work based on something inspiring that you might see in a minute. So I will get rid of that. You don't need a reminder for the event that I'm already in. <laughs> okay. So what I will show first is this beautiful book. And we'll bring it down. This is Mary Matilda Howard's Ocean Flowers and Their Teaching. So it's quite gilt. If you move it around, you can see the, the glare of the light, but also the glare of the gold. And I'll show you in En Vraie Vie the example that Kristen shows. What's really remarkable about this book is that it was published for a public audience. It was, a mo the, many editions came out, multiple editions came out, but because it is a botanical specimen book, she actually collected the specimens, dried and mounted them in every book of the edition. So if you think through the logistics, that is a lot of handwork. And this here, oh, it's very bright on screen. Sorry, everyone. Um, this is the color that I, referred to when I was choosing my yarn. I also did the thing as you, as most knitters do, when you're walking through the yarn store, you're holding things up next to each other and seeing what will work well with others. But I also had the advantage of having all of these images in my mind and having drawn from them. It's very bright. I it's better if I turn this off. Yes, much better. better. Okay, there we go. Now we can see it a little bit better. Sorry about that. Some of the other examples, including the Helidris specimen, I think I flagged that one as well, and lost it, of course. Um, but this collector is based in England. So these, are, these were all gathered around the, the seas and waters around England. And in here, there's algaes, seaweed, zoophytes, and corallines, and other oceanic plants. And it's really a contemporary review of this called it a, quote, perfect gem of art and nature, because she combines the specimens with poetry or description of it on the left-hand side. So it's really a beautiful and well-preserved copy, because the specimens are actually still in place. They're not, they have loosened over time, and they have this beautiful imprint also on the other page. So you get that three dimensionality. And that's what really caught my attention as we were going through and looking for inspiration for this pattern. This one um, is not a commonplace book. There was a question in the chat about that. This one is actually a published specimen book. Um, and I'll show you next an actual commonplace book. I actually, I, I wish you hadn't asked that because then I would seem better prepared. So I, I was looking into it and I actually don't know the edition run on that one. I know that like the print run, I know that there were multiple editions, but I actually don't know. But something that I'll have to look into and maybe I can send out in a follow-up message because you can imagine the work involved yeah. in, in mounting all of the specimens therein. So this one is a commonplace book, which is in the Victorian era was essentially an everyday scrapbook. It's where you saved all of the things that you wanted to refer back to or your mementos, souvenirs, and the like. So this one 
was created by four sisters, the Malkin sisters. And in terms of age, someone asked about that as well. Likely they were young women. I don't have a concrete uh, age for them. But their names, Anne Eliza, Emily Maria, Mary Edith, and Louisa Elizabeth Malkin. This gives us the rare opportunity to witness a group of women who work together on a publication or publication to be shared between them. During their travels to country houses, chapels, the seaside, they document it by gathering specimens like this one. And also documenting what you see across the bottom is where they picked it up from and the date. So this was gathered from a... Ooh, Ecclesburn, Glen, October of 1844. And the other thing that makes this interesting as a commonplace book is it also, so not only specimens, but also images, um, postcards, souvenir cards from the great houses that they visited and the like. It's interesting too, to see the level of botanical knowledge that they had and chose to include. So some things they give the place that they were gathered, others they simply give uh, or they give more information about the, the actual plant. But there is a, once again, like Mary Howard's book, there's a beautiful reflection in the facing page that, um, it's funny, you gave the inverse patterns for your color work chart. There's a little bit of that here too. You can see the inverse reflection of, of the item in the facing page. I was particularly captivated by ferns. So I might, you know, draft some more charts and make a fern version of this cowl at some point in the future. And what we really want today is to give you all the inspiration and the tools and the collections to do this for yourselves as well. So this one dates from 1836 to 1866, and it comes to us from England. And this one was purchased in the last couple of years by Lauren for the Black Wood. So one of the others I'm going to show you is that monumental one that I started with. Catherine Parr Trail's Wildflowers of Canada. So this one is from the early day, the very early days of Canada. It was published in 1868. And for those of you who happen to be from the States, <laughs> Canada was became Canada singular in 1867. Before that, it was Upper Canada, Lower Canada. And in 1867, they were united. And this book did remarkably well um, after that time. We'll try the light. Nope, we'll turn the light off. Um, because there was a new nationalist sort of spirit. So something that documented the plants of this place was actually it sold remarkably well and was well received. So this is the one that I mentioned was illustrated by Agnes Dunbar Fitzgibbon Chamberlain with all of her names. She illustrated the work. It was written, the, the botanical descriptions were written by her aunt who was Catherine Parr Trail. They, she was an authoress who is well known for her, her books, The Backwoods of Canada and The Female Emigrant's Guide. In Canadian literature, the name is Catherine Parr Trail is, is well known. <laughs> Quite canonical at this point. Um, but I knew her only through the culinary side of her of her work. So I had never actually seen this one before looking for things created by women about botany. So this is created entirely by women, but at the publishers, at the authors and illustrators' insistence, it was also created entirely in Canada. The publisher was John Lovell of Montreal, and when they proposed this, that he said it was too expensive to produce here in Montreal. And so what they did is they published it by subscription. The, the illustrator also took the extra step of um, becoming the lithographer as well. Lithography is a process of color, of printing rather, by drawing an image directly onto a lithographic stone. And then the stones are used to print the images, which are in black and white. So I once again ask you to think about the time required. They were quite successful in selling subscriptions. They sold 500 for the first edition of this book at $5 each. That was actually quite expensive at the time. And for comparison, one of the other most well-known books that was published by subscription was Audubon's Birds of North America. For the last of his editions, he only had 168 subscribers. Of course, it was more expensive, I'm sure. <laughs> but this one, she was remarkably successful. 500 is quite high. but. That meant there were 500 copies that they had to color by hand, by hand. So she was a watercolor painter, very talented, 
and well-trained. And this is um, Trillium in the center, Trillium erect and purple Trillium that you can see in the forests of Montreal and Eastern Ontario. So if you picture her, she actually recruited her daughters and some young assistants, and they meticulously hand colored every plate in this edition and all of the subsequent editions until the technology changed a little bit more by the fourth edition and she no longer wanted to hand color 500 copies. So talking about handwork, this is kind of inspiring. We didn't translate anything this complex into our pattern, but it merits being on display for the amount of work and the, the story of the women that created this and how really how successful it was at the time. So I'm gonna show another book in contrast with this one, we have something perhaps more practical, but less lovely. So this one, I can actually like zoom in, make it bigger for you. Because it's a pocket guide. And this one I include, even though it was likely published and illustrated by a man, this one um, is something that the plant collectors of the day may have actually tucked into a pocket or purse and taken out into the field when they went. It identifies, it has a couple of, of colored, hand colored illustrations once more, but it actually has the scientific names and definitions for the different parts of plants and species. Actually, that way is right side up. But I show it more in contrast for the size. So this one would have been much less expensive to produce <laughs> on a small scale than Catherine Partridge. What's the year? Oh, sorry. I have notes and I should tell you that. Just a moment. <laughs> oh, I didn't actually catch this one. And well, let's see. 1800. It won't focus oh. for me. This one's earlier. But it's 1800. And this one is printed in London and uh, illustrated with copper plate engravings. And it would have been printed from those plates and then hand colored the same as the later technology. By a certain point, chromolithography um, had been in, developed so they could actually print in color and eliminate that very meticulous but amazing craft work of hand coloring. So now, because we created a color work pattern, I decided to pull some color inspiration from the collections beyond the natural co history collections. So I'm gonna show you something of interest perhaps to the crocheters in the group. This is a color sample card for Clark's Brilliant Crochet Cotton. I'm going to lock that in again. I will, yes. I'm just trying to show the cover. There you go. So that's a company that, how many in the room or on, on chat, does anyone recognize that name, Clark's? There's some people, if you go into the fiber community on Ravelry, there's people who still hunt this up for crochet. Clark's is still um, a crochet cotton that's quite sought after. This one was dates from the late 19th century or early 20th. Uh, in our catalog description, it says 1866, but it was likely on display in stores in the beginning of the 20th century. And if I zoom in a little bit more, you'll be able to see pencil marks. This would have been used as a sample book in a shop. Either the vendor or the client themselves would have checked off what colors they wanted to order, and then they would have placed their order and received it either by courier, by post, or in the store itself as they, once they stocked it. I include it here because the color selection is just beautiful and stunning. And it's one of a few different sample books that we have that shows really the color fastness of 20th century dyes. It's quite remarkable, I find, anyways. Um, and the technology, of course, has continued to improve and natural dyes are making quite a resurgence, natural dyeing in the, in the wool community in particular. At this point, this was all chemical dyes. So I'm showing another one. This is from a French dye manufacturer, Ampolina. And this one shows the actual colors on wool swatches. And then I'll show the next one is on silk. So it's interesting to see the contrast on which fiber take the dye differently. And this one is Ampolina. The Montreal distributor of this or Quebec distributor was Baribot and Fils. 
And what it is, it once again has these pencil annotations on the colors that they want, which in this case was seal brown at the bottom. It wouldn't have been my first choice, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's bilingual and these are still color fast after more than 100 years. So color chemical dyes like this one, Diamant and Ampoina were the two large name ones. They really came and advanced hugely in the, in, um, the 19th century. Chemistry advanced very, very quickly at the time. And it was an important shift from natural to synthetic dyes. Um, William Perkin was an 18 year old in 1856. And he synthesized a crucial ingredient for synthetic dyes from a substance known as coal tar, which is not something I had heard of before looking into this, but it's a crucial ingredient for all synthetic dyes. And what it did was actually create, he, he synthesized what's called movine. So purple synthetic dye was one of the first synthetic dyes. And it sparked a craze in that era for purple in the Victorian era, including the queen herself. Queen Victoria wore a purple gown to the 1862 World Fair. And it was really the purple craze. Louise Lalanger, another scholar, she writes that Germany, I'll show the next one while I continue. Um, Germany was really the, the forefront of this color color development. And this one is silk ribbon. I keep wanting the lighting to be better, but it's too much. Okay, it's too much. Um, but this one is silk ribbon and it takes the dye just as well. For those of you who knit with silk, the colors are often, I, I almost find that it's more saturated than wool. I, I don't know, anyway. I, I quite enjoy the, the silk colors and the texture of a silk blend wool. This one is from France, sorry? The chemical is called, well, the element is called movine or aniline. Yeah, no problem. They, one thing that's interesting is they never list ingredients at the time. So I'm sure that the synthetic and artificial dyes had things that were noxious. So that's for the seal? Uh, yes, for both. And, and the other one? Yes, these are both from the same company called Ampolina. And you can actually still find, if you start hunting on the internet, uh, old chemical dye, like from this brand, what they would have stocked in a druggist, the like display mechanism, which are very nice to look at. I should have included a picture because I can't describe it, but it's a wooden cupboard full of all of the different colors of ampoulina dyes in their tubes like this. So it came in that and it gives you concrete instructions on how to dye your stuff, whether it's silk or wool or whatever, but it also gives you this color chart on all of the different colors that you could make by combining different amounts of, it, of the dyes, which for someone who's actually interested in, in experimenting with that today is a useful tool that I'm sure exists in a more easily accessible digital format, unfortunately. But if you want to be inspired by the originals, you can come and consult them here. Uh, would they have used arsenic in those dyes? Is that, that was an issue. Yes, arsenic in particular is was known to be involved in the vibrant emerald green. Um, and I'm not sure about the chemical dyes for fabric, but I know that that was true for papers and dyeing, leather and end papers and certain books at the time. This one is from France once again, and this is the color palette of the season. It's quite hard to show. I should hold it up, I will, yes. So there it is under the camera, but in, I can do so safely. It unfolds to show the color palette of that season in the south of France. So just like just like all of the color palettes of the windows and shop fronts on St. Catherine change with each season, these are the colors that were created and in style according to that company at that year. Question. The country, oh sorry, the company is the Fédération de la Soie. So it's the silk producers of Lyon and the, in particular, a company called Ruban de Saint-Étienne. So ribbons from Saint-Étienne. So it's the, the soie nouveauté, the new things in silk. It's really very beautiful. This one is quite durable, so I'll have it out on display at the end here for you to look at. I'm gonna show two others that one of these, this one here is digitized and you can look at it on the internet archive. So we will put a link in the chat um, this one is quite fragile, so I will, we won't be having it out for, for interaction, but we can show you. Do you want to grab that? It's called Werner's Nomenclature of Color. Does that ring any bells? Yeah. 
Werner, there's, I'm seeing some nods. Werner's nomenclature of colors. So this, how many of you have heard of Pantone? These days, yes. So before Pantone, there were other theories of color and other names that sort of defined colors. And this Werner was one of the important ones. And Werner, this one is particularly interesting because he includes swatches, of course. So you can see actual samples that are pasted in here. I'm gonna zoom in a bit to see if we can make it legible for everyone. Because what you see is that there's a swatch and then there's a description here at the top of the column, it's animal, vegetable, and mineral. And what he did is a very, very useful tool for artists at the time, because he describes meticulously where that color would have been found in the animal kingdom, in the vegetable kingdom, when relevant, and in the mineral kingdom. So on this one, there's a blackish gray at the bottom that you would find in nature on a, the back of a nuthatch, and in vegetables on the old stem of a hawthorn, and in the mineral world in flint or a greenish gray in the quill feathers of a robin, the bark of an ash tree, or a clay slate whack. I'm afraid, I don't know what that is. W-A-C-K-E, in the mineral kingdom, I don't know what that is. But his book was incredibly useful. It went through, this one dates from 1821. It went through a second printing. And the system of classification that he uses was first, devised by a German mineralogist whose name, well, this, this is him, Werner. And this dates from the late 18th century. So this one was reprinted many times. And a Scottish painter whose name was Patrick Syme, he updated the guide, matching color swatches with his own list of categories of places to, to identify the nomenclature. And it's worth mentioning, this one really is influential and that's a very boring color that I've left it on. Let's, let's move to something rosy maybe, or aquamarine, there you go, aquamarine. And this one is verdigris, which you can find in the tail of a small long-tailed green parrot, or of course, copper green. So his nomenclature numbered up, um, you can now probably find a corresponding Pantone color for each of these number or a uh, hex code, all of our, our modern ways of talking about color. But this one has so much enduring love that it actually got reissued in 2018 as a pocket-sized edition by the Smithsonian. And the tagline on that edition is actually the book that Charles Darwin used to describe colors on his voyage on the HMS Beagle. So it was very influential and very widely used at the time. It's on in the internet archive. So I encourage you, if you're looking for color inspiration, you can go to nature and you can go to Werner and you can find where you would find all of these colors. It's a beautiful, beautiful object. I'm gonna show one more. This one is also from a German. <laughs> they really were influential in the world of color, in color printing, in dye and printing technology too. So this one dates much later. We'll zoom out. This one is from the Bauhaus era. This is a reproduction, it's not the original, but this one is from the Bauhaus era by Johannes, Johannes Itten. He, it's part of a larger work called The Art of Color, his color theory that he taught as part of the foundational course at the Bauhaus to incoming students. So I'm gonna unfold the whole thing and I will pass this part back to you. What he did was take an existing model of color, which was actually a globe uh, developed by Otto Runge, his, uh, another German color theorist that preceded him. And he flattened the globe into a star uh, with the very saturated darks at the points, the less saturated whites at the center. And what he did is um, he used this as to describe the kingdom of color, as he, as he said. Um, and the multi-dimensional possibilities that you can do with color. So what I love this one in particular because it is, as we classify it, an interactive book. So you have the color star and what he did was make it possible to build color chords, dyadic chords, triadic chords, quadratic, five tone, six tone chords. So what you do is you put the disc in place 
and you rotate to form the complementary chord as Johannes Itten defined them. So he used this as a teaching tool to have his students think through the relationship of color to each other. And Kristen's very quickly mentioned trick about taking a photo and making it black and white and checking your contrast. I was like, oh, that's very relevant. I did not do that with mine. Um, but Johannes Itten might be another color check for you. <laughs> you can see if there is harmony, according to Johannes Itten, in your contrasting or complementary colors. And I'm going to check my phone to see how many, if we have questions coming in, but you, I'm more than happy to take questions, as is Kristen. We will also be happy for some of these books will be out so that those in person can look at them. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the sample books, the botanical specimen books are a little too fragile, but we'll have some of the others out that you can interact with. But I do want to show you this lovely effect, just because <laughs> it's so fun. And then the, the more interesting one, I think, is like a tritone chord, which in music is a very uncomfortable chord. <laughs> However, in color, winds up, the black actually does make you see combinations in a different way. So it brings the colors together and they speak to each other in a different language, which Itin's book is really quite interesting in that it makes you see it in a different way. So we'll put that one aside. Johannes Itin, yes. And his, his larger work, it's called the Ara, the art of color, a color theory that was published before this, which was published in 1921. So the last one I'm going to show you was a recent find. I found it literally in the stacks yesterday. Um, and when you work with rare collections, it's always a joy because those surprises happen often. This one is in our accession, so it actually was likely a recent acquisition, and we have been acquiring more works about knitting um, because there's an interest. <laughs> there's an interest. So this one, sorry, I should have showed the cover. It's called The Lady's Assistant to Knitting, Netting, and Crochet Work. And this one I include here. It's by Mrs. Jane Gogay. And this is a third edition of this work. So we have also a, a, an earlier edition and it was about this thick and this one grew. <laughs> the multi with each edition, she added more patterns and more content. And most interestingly, she added colored illustrations, which at the time as well, this one was 1844. These would have been hand colored. So what she included is illustrations as seen in receipt 163 for instance this is a stocking she has receipts as she writes it for knitting patterns for crochet for tatting lace and and for motifs and color work that would work with all of those crafts so it's an interesting book for that it's very badly colored in comparison with the Agnes Fitzgibbons book. But you can see it's quite interesting because we have here in some ways a ready-made color work pattern that we could put up online and anyone could try out, try their hand at. Although I wouldn't necessarily choose that color cord. I might consult Johannes Itten and use a non-yellow toned color cord. But it's a beautiful thing to see, even from edition to edition, how this book changed. And the color work patterns are, are quite charming. When you see it up close, and I will put this one out, it seems like a, a kind of almost chalky gouache paint or watercolor, um, but it's I think it's probably gouache based, the paints in this one, unlike the, uh, the Par Trail book. This one also, um, I'll turn pages for if you want to see it, but it includes endless pages of patterns written as they were in 1844. So it's quite different than our contemporary knitting patterns. This one is a working receipts, cast on 24 stitches on one pin. And she also actually helpfully includes all of the abbreviations that she uses for each craft, which was not often the case. As we delved into historical knitting patterns, that was not often true. And you need a translator or you need the glossary um, to be able to read them. But Pearl, you could, you'll notice that word if you can read it, um, is spelled a little differently. It's spelled like an ocean pearl back then in this publication. 
rather than P-U-R-L. So things, and this one, for instance, spells pot ta 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 It has P-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T-O-T. It's not the most succinct of pattern writing styles. So I'll compliment Kristen that her pattern is much more succinct <laughs> than what was published in 1844. So that's the last one that I'm gonna show. And now I will happily check my phone and look for questions. If we have any, we're also welcome to um, take questions from the room. We just ask if you do have a question in the room that you come up next to the podium, you don't have to be on camera, but the mic will pick you up if you're up here or I will repeat it for you. So we have answered the one about commonplace books. Oh, and Kristen, this one's for you. About what is the message on your Morse code pillow cover? Oh, delightful. Uh, the Morse, the, the two pillows um, are both from our knitting collaboration <laughs> last year, which was about uh, wartime knitting and uh, perhaps even more interestingly, uh, knitting in code. And so the gray pillow um, has a, uh, the first stanza of a poem about knitting during the world wars. Um, essentially, uh, whereas we often have, we have some very famous poems from men's perspective of world wars from the battlefront. This poem instead gives the perspective of women left behind on the home front who are producing wartime knitting. Um, and so uh, in the pattern, which is available on Ravelry, we ha I have a link to the digitized version of that poem. I can't remember the title of the poem off the top of my head, um, but we can pull that up. Uh, but so it's the first stanza of that poem. Um, and if you wanted to knit something in Morse code, uh, I have instructions for how to do that with anything that you want to write yourself in that pattern, including an empty chart. So you can fill it in yourself or knit the poem as well. Yes. Thanks, Kristen. Yes. One for me. I'll read it for my own. That's the one I couldn't answer. How many editions, how many copies of the edition? Sorry, everyone, I will find out. I tried to look that up as, as well and I didn't find any information quickly. So I'm sure that it's out there somewhere and as librarians, we're very good at finding that kind of information, um, but it's not immediately clear. Yes. And th there's a question here about colors. Once again, the German scientists who were working on early color development did they not patent all the colors that they generated? And that's a great question and an avenue of research you could look into. I think likely the, the one whose name I mentioned was that forerunner, William Perkin, that would be a place to start. You could find the ingredients um, and aniline that's it's well known and well documented, it included in many, many plant dyes now. And, or sorry, or <coughs> synthetic dyes. So there's synthetic dyes, there's artificial dyes and there are natural dyes, of course for which you need different mordants and the dyeing process is much more complex. Something that I know very little about, but would like to learn more I've about. done a bit, yeah. um, but just the, the simplest natural dyeing, which is onion skins, because you don't need any of the extra stuff to make it uh, you know, stick, uh, stay. Um, but of course it's not, it's not color fast, right? Particularly with the sun. So over time, my pumpkin orange shawl uh, will not be so pumpkin, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing how that changes over time. I could uh, always dye it again. I could always dye it again. It was very fun. I highly recommend onion skin dyeing. Mm. Not a hard one to gather. Yes, there's a lot of different processes that you can use as um, a mordant before and an after treatment. What's the name of the after treatment? I don't remember that terminology. There's mm -hmm. a there's a specific name Use for it. vinegar to a rinse to set normal, yeah. to set your dye out. But it still won't be um, sun fast. Yeah, it still yes. will lighten over time. Yes, and and someone did helpfully chime in that whack is a stone. <laughs> <laughs> it is a sedimentary rock, <laughs> also delightful. known as dirty sandstone. Yes, it was used. Gray whack was used a great deal in ancient Egypt. Okay. Gray whack used a great deal in ancient Egypt sculpture. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> and another comment from the chat actually about Ver Werner's nomenclature is that it's used in art instruction still to this day. Your son has a book as part of his college art class. So there's the color theory standing strong to this day. The, Question the books you. that um, you show that have flora and fauna in them. Yes. Maybe it's a stupid question, but what's holding them to the page? What's the adhesive, you know? This and, is a great question. And is there something 
on top of the floor as well to protect it. The so answer to the last question is no. That's what I said. Um, however, I will put this back under the document camera and I can show um, two contrasts. So this, this one, oh, hang on, there we go. Um, the commonplace book, this one has nothing in front of the pressed samples. This is one that was made for sort of personal use and with their own family. And they didn't have the same standards as something that was printed for public sale. So this one has nothing protecting it. They would have used an adhesive of some kind. However, I think the one who could answer that question really well would be Lauren Lauren. Williams. (laughs) Um, And she's, like I said, not, not here today, but we can look into it. It would have been an adhesive, I don't know, what kind at the time or what the base ingredients would have been. What's yeah. the earliest example that you would know of a book like this with? The earliest example? I mean, this type of publication specifically created by women um, really became much more popular in the Victorian era. Um, the earliest example, I'm sure, is far, far earlier. Uh, but I'm not sure where in the world it would have been from the practice of preserving flowers between the pages of a book. You can find weird remnants in many medieval manuscripts, <laughs> whether they're there intentionally Usually or accidentally, accidentally. <laughs> is up for debate. So something that is actually created, we have one great example in our collection is the Herbaria of Aldafiki here in our collection of the Gale. Right. So that one is much earlier. I don't remember off the top of my head what, what year that dates from. I think 1100 or 1300. Yeah. It's somewhere around there, but that's one of the earlier examples of something that's very well preserved as well. Um, but that one was illustrated. So something where the plants actually survive, I'm not sure what the earliest example is. Sometimes what you will see is a sheet of tissue that sometimes covers the plant example and protects it from the printed page and vice versa. In these particular examples, that's not the case, but yes. A lot of the plant collectors actually did submit full specimen pages to other naturalists. And those examples live on in Herbaria, including one that we have here at McGill out at Matt campus. There's a really great project. That yes, we will and share I, link I actually saw that um, Heather joined us today. This is something else that I linked in the pattern, but um, Heather Rogers, who uh, got both a master in information studies here, as well as an MA in digital humanities has done an amazing online project on the McGill a uh, botanist whose name I cannot recall right now. I can't either. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's a really excellent uh, project and is a really great place to go to look for other inspiration as well. Um, and that one is particularly rich in Canadian and Arctic plants. Yes, yeah. yes, especially Arctic plants. Yeah. Um, so, Ruby, uh, yes, more questions from, <laughs> uh, from the room and from the Zoom. Sorry, from the YouTube chat. There is a... Uh, a comment about alum as a mordant, right? For your onions. Uh, yes, I remember having, I remember. However, was, then you have to know what alum is. This so was a deep step pandemic one. project for me, very, um, you know, in spring 2020. And I remember trying desperately hard to find affordable alum without having to go anywhere um, and, and, and struggling very hard with that at the time. I, I bet it would be easier today, uh, but that was like a, a May 2020 project for me. <laughs> There's two different things. So the comment was, is it called allium? That is actually another plant. Yeah, Um, that's a plant. Allium is the like onion and garlic family of plants. Um, But allium itself, I think is a chemical substance. Yes, I was attempting to buy it in powder form. Yeah, It's it's not that (laughs) weird, but I couldn't find any of the time. Another question for you from the chat is how can we contact you about the wartime knitting research that you did last year? Uh, yes, so we do have uh, the recording from last year's presentation about the wartime um, knitting available on YouTube. I have not had time uh, to do any extra research on it since then, but that uh, presentation had much more um, uh, content from me as opposed uh, to, to you from Jacqueline this time um, about that. Um, and I really highly encourage you to watch that recording if you're interested in, and I'm happy to correspond over email as well to chat about it. It's very interesting. We will send out our contact information and follow up message. Two more from the room and then I have one more from the chat. Two. Yes. Just a quick plug for you, Jacqueline. Oh, thank you. The, uh, <laughs> a quick plug for me, for everyone yeah, on no, this the YouTube chat. organized last month, unfortunately I couldn't come, 
like women is mm -hmm. well, yes i mentioned it at the beginning yes and that's a excited. great resource for those of you who are interested about the women who actually collected these botanical specimens, interested about their class and position in life, a lot of those answers can be found in Tina's talk. Um, because for some women like Par Trail and Agnes Fitzgibbon who turned to publishing, writing and illustrating to make a living after their husbands died, some women did that. They turned to botanical collecting as a way of making a living when their partners in life either through accident, injury, or disease, we're no longer able to do that. So Tina's talk can answer a lot of those questions. I'll refer you to that. It's a really wonderful talk. I highly recommend it. I um, uh, listened to it while I was developing the pattern as part of the ways that I was thinking about what we wanted to create with this project. Mm -hmm. And one more question here. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Clark Crochet Cotton. Yes. Uh, and I imagine that I might be wrong, perhaps you know, Clark was maybe even to this day the producer of sewing guard. Cotton. Yes, All that's exactly right. So the question, the comment um, is about Clark's cotton. And the comment or question was to this day, are they the is it the Clark that produces sewing thread? And I am also a sewist. Um, so I Yay for Me Made Bay. This is a great event for sewists this month where we share our makes. I use it all the time. So Clark's and Coates and Clark, they exactly. merged at a certain point. And those two, that, that company still makes thread, particularly excellent quality, heavy duty thread for coats, bags, heavier duty weight projects. Yes, absolutely. So that, that sample card, which you can see, is the precursor before they merged with Coates and Clark. So thank you for that. Good comment. I will check my phone for one last comment from the chat. We'll see. Great. Okay. There, and yeah, there's some interesting follow up about natural dyeing in the YouTube. Oh, we have one in the room. Sorry, sorry. Continue. Um, when we're looking on Ravelry, what's your Ravelry username to find the pattern? Uh, yes, my Ravelry username is uh, all one word, the closest knit. <laughs> we will so, send that out as yeah. well. Don't worry. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and the question was what what her Ravelry oh, username is. One more, yeah. Who? Um, the question is, you've done the color work, the Mobius cowl in color work. What about doing it in a brioche knit? That's a fantastic, wonderful idea, and would be so beautiful and interesting. And I am not ready to dip my uh, my toes in designing that yet. I uh, am even a timid brioche knitter. I've done it a few times, but not lots and lots. I find it difficult to correct the mistakes. Um, but it's so delightful and squishy. But such a wonderful it finish. It would be a really, really comfortable item. To Absolutely. Wear. So it's a great idea. You should make it yes. and then uh, and then share it with us. <laughs> and then share it with us. Okay. We'd love to go this direction too. Yes. Do you think like the chart would be like I don't know if that would I mean you could do it with a seam and you could invert how you carried your brioche colors. Oh, and that was the other, you, that's a good reminder, apologies. I need to refer all of you if you're interested in it. The resource that's really great for stranded color work, because this one does have some longer floats. And yes, you need, it does. And catching your floats is something like, I choose to carry one yarn in each hand when I do two color, mm -hmm. color work. Um, and catching your floats is really easy that way. But which yarn you hold in which hand changes what color is dominant in your piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a really great resource by Roxanne Richardson. Her video on it, yeah. we can include the link. It's really great. It helped me understand it in a way that I had never taken the intellectual time to look into before. But her resource is really great because it makes the color change. It looks different if you carry your dominant yarn different. And her video really demonstrates that well. I can't see it in my own. I know it's off. I'm just looking at it myself. But it does it does change. So the seaweed pops differently mm -hmm. from the pattern if you carry the contrast color in your dominant as your dominant yarn, or if you carry the background color as your dominant yarn. So the, the seaweed is a little let more embedded into the background if you use the, the background color as your dominant yarn. So it's an interesting thing that I had never really given much thought to, which is surprising for how much color I love color work knitting. So I will, we will include the link to that because it's a great resource from Roxanne Richardson. You can watch the video on YouTube. Um, but yes, thank you all. I think we reached the end of our time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for coming this time to create another pattern from our collections. So we look forward to sharing it with you. We will send it out and you'll send the link to us on Ravelry as well. Don't be fooled, my Ravelry picture is a dinosaur, but it is me. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. you too. I'm <laughs> <laughs>